hope is but the doorway to faith and trust. And this is how you can go beyond just hoping for change, you know, actually having an action, the ability to perceive and to shift and grow with the changes that are needed, you know, in order to support and assist and love. Queen Lili Uokalani, Hawaii Kingdom, 1898. O honest Americans, as Christians, hear me for my downtrodden people. Their form of government is as dear to them as yours is precious to you. Quite as warmly as you love your country, so they love theirs. With all your goodly possessions, covering a territory so immense that there yet remain parts unexplored, Possessing islands that, although near at hand, had to be neutral ground in time of war. Do not covet the little vineyard of Naboth so far from your shores, lest the punishment of Ahab fall upon you, if not in your day, in that of your children. For be not deceived, God is not mocked. The people to whom your fathers told of the living God and taught to call father, and whom the sons now seek to despoil and destroy, are crying aloud to him in their time of trouble. And he will keep his promise, and he will listen to the voices of his Hawaiian children lamenting for their homes. It is for them that I would give my last drop of blood. It is for them that I would spend, nay, am spending everything belonging to me. Will it be in vain? It is for the American people and their representatives in Congress to answer these questions. As they deal with me and my people, kindly, generously, and justly. So may the great ruler of all nations deal with the grand and glorious nation of the United States of America. The realization that unless more people know the truth, it's never going to go back. None of us knew anything. It was all in the, the elders. They all knew. When my daughter was going to school, Crack me up, you know, 18 years later, is my daughter with school books. The same book that we learned from is what she's learning from. And how Hawaii became part of America was one paragraph. And it said that the people wanted to become part of the United States, which is totally not true. is a bit of sandalwood from my friend Uncle Mackey, who is a Hawaiian elder, master canoe builder, and tiki carver. I am not Hawaiian. I don't live currently in Hawaii. I actually haven't lived there full time since 2013. But it's been one of the most important characters, beings, energy, symbols in my spiritual awakening. It wasn't until just last year that I really began to put the pieces together of its true history. Hawaii is a illegally occupied sovereign country. There's so much information out there that people can absolutely go out and do their own research if you're curious. But I do encourage people just to 
feel in to this video if this is an idea that you maybe haven't come across before or maybe you do already understand the full story and maybe there's even just a deeper space that we can go into, this deeper heart space of being able to see Hawaii's story as perhaps the most recent depiction of a cycling that humanity is going through. An overture was, you know, today we understand that it was wrong, it was not legal, treaties were not honored by all, all the countries, pretty much all the countries of the world, you know, everybody stood back as the United States took over Hawaii. Perhaps there's a few of you that are like, wait, what's going on? Hawaii is a state. Like, I don't understand any of this story. It leads me to what I'm really sensitive to, and that's stories. That's how we learn. We learn through stories. I asked my grandmother a long time ago, when I first started learning about the Hawaiian um, culture, how people, how Captain Cook came and all this stuff, and I asked her, I said, you know, because there's this big sovereignty issue also of the things that were not done so porno, so right. Um, I asked her about that, and she goes, she looked at me, and she listened to what I had to say. And she says, very simply, how else will the world learn about aloha? How else will the world be able to understand how to love things without no conditions being attached to it, no attachments to the outcome. I'm loving you so that I can get this. Not, none whatsoever, you know. And she really believed that Hawaii needed its experiences that it's had in order to go ahead and effect change in the world, the ways that we choose to do it. Aloha is but one of those ways, the main way. We can receive the true stories of Earth, stories of great challenge, and see them as sagas that are happening within our worlds and be able to utilize them for the symbols that they are, to be able to interpret our physical reality much like we would interpret a dream reality and the importance of larger collective stories and then also the importance of individual stories like my friend Uncle Mackie. Yeah, it's, like I say, it's a huge story. Hawaii was made an independent sovereign state. It was given its independence in 1843. It was made part of the family of nations. Its constitution was so progressive. It was one of the most progressive constitutions in the world at the time. Because they were so progressive, anyone could own land, anyone could be part of the government, regardless of where you were originally born. There were many treaties then that were put out that continued to to say, please recognize Hawaii as its own sovereign state. Do not just take this land. If you do that, that is an act of war. And this was recognized between many, many different countries at the international law level. But again, the constitution was so progressive that many different missionaries, descendants of missionaries, began to be able to own land and also hold positions within the government. A lot of people have, I mean, this is all, they've, they've Families have spent generations here building something. And if you went back to a different system, they'd probably um, lose what they have. It would probably be a redistribution of, of land and, and finances. So it's, it's a tough thing, you know. Um, the sugar plantations begin to boom, big, big, big business. There should be a different government in place in Hawaii, making different choices that more reflect the Hawaiian people than Western economics, because that's what it's mm -hmm. all about, is money. 
Then we jump to 1887, where we have the Bayonet Constitution. The king at the time, King Kalakaua, was elected after the last of the Kamehameha kings died. Elected not by a popular vote, but by the Hawaiian legislature at the time. A mix of Hawaiians and white missionary descendants. King Kalakaua was a controversial and contrasting king, who supported the practice and expression of Hawaiian knowledge. The king was forced to sign this constitution at the Blades of Bayonets. Now what this constitution did was severely restrict the rights of Hawaiian subjects and citizens. In some cases, not being able to vote or own land. In 1891, King Kalakaua died. His younger sister, Lili Uokalani, was made queen. It was one of her first intentions to change back the constitution, to make it so that Native Hawaiian had all of the rights that they originally once had. The people that did the overthrow, their reasoning for doing it was because they were going to lose a lot of their investments. The queen was going to change the constitution and things were on the edge of being changed and not for their betterment. So it was, it was like, wow, well, we better do something now before it changes. So they then wrote to America saying that there was a revolution happening. The Marines were sent to Oahu to stop this so-called rebellion. She peacefully, temporarily surrendered and then wrote to President Cleveland at the time and said, hey, I'm not going into a physical war, but I know my legalese enough that now we are going to enter into exactly that, a legal war. <laughs> Historically, president found out about the overthrow, sent an envoy to Hawaii, he had made a report, went back to the president, was supposed to give Hawaii back, but he was elected out of office. On July 4th, 1894, Stanford Dole announced the inauguration of the Republic of Hawaii and declared himself president. Queen Lili'u Okolani was found guilty of treason. The part that's holding everything back is, you know, the outside of Hawaii. They want Hawaii to stay the way it is. And the, the military and its strategic placement in Hawaii. And then you get the economics of all the financial investment into the land and the outside uh, influence of, of money that keeps us locked into this, this, the way, this way of life. It's hard to conceive how it can happen, and even till today, it still goes on. And that's probably why a lot of Hawaiians still, you know, they, they have a lot of resentment, a lot of anger, a lot of hate, because nothing's been done. In aims to calm Hawaiian revolutions, to save the lives of the arrested rebels, and to prevent bloodshed of her people, Queen Lili'uokalani signed an official abdication of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1895. However, she continued to appeal to President Cleveland for reinstatement. It seems as though President Cleveland genuinely did all he could from 1893 to 1897 to assist Queen Lili'uokalani in restoring her throne. But unfortunately, he was outweighed by the lobbyists and Congress did nothing to restore the monarchy. You know, there's a petition that was signed by 30,000 Hawaiians at the time, which is a big number, um, that, you know, asked the president to restore the Hawaiian Kingdom. William McKinley, American expansionist, became president in 1897. American victory of the Spanish-American War in 1898 led to the acquisition of Guam, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and the Hawaiian Kingdom as U.S. territories. Everybody's a native in some place. This deeper heart space of being able to see Hawaii's story as perhaps the most recent depiction of a cycling that humanity is going through. 
something that's in us all. It's part of being a human being, I guess. It's in, the, it's in our DNA to want to be more loving and more open and to receive the same thing back. And so that's what makes it possible for more growth in, in aloha or in loving one another where disliking and hating is easy, but it's so much easier to be open and loving. Everybody is native, everybody. You know, it's not just us and them. We are all natives of this earth. One of my favorite quotes by Lily Ookalani, the way to lose any earthly kingdom is to be inflexible, intolerant, and prejudicial. Another way is to be too flexible, tolerant of too many wrongs, and without judgment at all. It is a razor's edge. It is the width of a blade of pubic grass. And so we all are here to assist and help each other. There have been some wrongs that have been done in our histories. And all of our ancestors did what they had to do in order for them to survive sometimes. But now that we are here at this point, this crooks in time, this point in time where it's important for us and we are able to ask for and receive forgiveness on such a level that restores so much to people's spirit, people's heart, blood, the settling of a lot of old scores, a lot of spirits being able to be passed over, so much things being cleared up on so much levels. It opens the way for a lot of things to happen instead of like walking through mud. And then we jumped to the 40s with the UN Charter. Many different countries that had been made territories were given back to their country of origin. Hawaii was left out of this charter. And then in 1959, Hawaii became a state. Um, it was, it was quite the, uh, quite the well thought out fraud. Mm -hmm that's been going on for 100 plus years. That's kind of the pressure for the people to become civilized, I guess. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. From, you know what, Western man or the overthrowers see as the, the progression of westernizing this place and eventually taking over and, you know, making it one state. That was like the end of, or what Hawaiians perceived to be the end of Hawaii. It's not done and gone, and even the elders have always said, Hawaii is not gone until there's no aloha. When no more aloha then, then it's not Hawaii anymore. Probably something else, but it's not Hawaii. So, uh, the only way to have change, Hawaii needs more support. More mm -hmm. people need to know the truth so they can make up their own minds and either um, oppose or agree. And, you know, there's still not enough people that agree mm -hmm. that what was wrong is wrong. And mm -hmm. It's so important, I really believe, for us to understand this story and to share it in our own ways. But we have to be brave enough to talk about it, to look at it from different angles. Because again, putting things in a context, when you understand the story and you go there and you, yeah, you know, you may feel a little bit of animosity or whatever, but from my experience, that's actually so few and far between. It's still just like nothing but aloha. I mean, my grandma, I could just imagine how she felt from you know, being born in Maui, um, the youngest of nine and living the way she lived, being born in the 20s and you know, she died in the 80s. How much change and unfairness that they live through and yeah, it's, 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 it's just amazing of, um, how they coped with that you know, and, and that's where you get a lot of Hawaiians or natives that become addicted to alcohol to try and block it all out. Drugs, alcohol and, and being violent because you're always angry. The anger's inside you know. Mm. 
right there at the, at the pier where it used to be open for everybody. Now only the commercial activities can use that pier. There's a gate with a key and the only guys get the key is if you get one permit and a business and you're doing kayak tours. You're the only guys that can use the pier or can park in there. It's like, wait a minute, you know. Mm. So, yeah. There's a bit of resentment in there. Kind of talk. Um, yeah, like the others say, we're no more aloha, we're no more Hawaii. And, and the way to receive that aloha is by giving it. Mm. The harder it gets, the more love you should put out. Mm. So this brings me to the importance of individual story. Again, that's how we're able to really take things in and to be able to take huge concepts, almost overwhelming stories, but when we hear it from a personal account, that's when we can resonate. That's when it really can make sense and land with us. My friend, Uncle Mac, Derek McGuire, he is a traditional canoe builder, tiki carver. He is an elder who has a certain amount of wisdom to bring through for the world. And play and intensity. Portrayed that, you know, all our Hawaiians are lazy because we didn't want to work in a plantation. And our Hawaiians said, you know, why would I go and work for you in this, doing this hard work during that time that is, you know, normally we don't work, we're at the beach, we're cooling off at the ocean, we're relaxing. You know, we've been up early in the morning when the sun came, first came up, we were up, tending our fields or doing our crops. You go in with the climate and still living by nature. When hot, why be in a hot sun? I mean, it's getting crispy. <laughs> and when it's cool, well, now's the time to get out there and do your, you know, do your chores, what you need to do. It just makes a whole lot more sense. And then we have these Western missionaries coming with their three layers of clothes, a t-shirt, a shirt, and then a coat over that. On top of that, you get a hat and you get shoes because your feet too soft to walk on the hot lava or walk on rock. So, you know, Hawaiians put on all this stuff, it's like, holy moly, what the heck? He's a great example of perseverance and transformation. And he's had some health issues the last couple of years and he's been in and out of the hospital. And then his sister, April, recently passed away. Almost a year to the date that my sister passed away. And they both passed completely unexpectedly, without any cause of death in their sleep. I fully believe that if you do what you love doing, what you what brings your body up to that highest state of vibration that you have, that's when the universe says, okay, there we go, we got that. Here. And it sends us the experiences that allows us to continue to vibe at that high of a state and high of a level. You guys have heard the voice of Auntie Aka intermixed in throughout this video. She's one of Mackie's teachers. Well, the, the, the first big thing in my life was one week before my first birthday was the tidal wave in Hilo. And we get caught in the backwater. Caught us and just kept tumbling us in the water. My grandfather holding on to my grandmother with one hand and holding on to me like a football. Grandmother always said, you know, she kept yelling at him, don't let go of the boy. So that was my first experience with the ocean and how I became part of the ocean. Mm. My grandmother always said, you part of the ocean. I have almost four hours of audio recording with me and Mackie telling his life story and how he learned how to be Hawaiian, how he learned about the Hawaiian overthrow, how he learned to make canoes, different connections that he has, understandings that he has about the land of Mu. The video is linked below of his interviews. And then also we do have a GoFundMe up for Uncle Mackie. There are so many different ways that we can know our true abundance as nature itself. The money is really helpful. And for Mackie in particular, it's not something that he did as the older version of himself to accept aid and help. So I think it's a way for him to know that he's supported, he's loved, to give him the opportunity to fully recover and heal, to keep sharing more. 
And so, you know, a little bit here or there, it all adds up one stone at a time. This is a way sharing a bit of your abundance, sharing a bit of your aloha. This is a way to take action. If you feel so inspired, that link will be left down below. It's to a lot of us that say, you know, the only way Hawaii and Hawaiians can survive is by accepting what's happened and be tolerant to the whole overthrow. But like a lot of us know, maybe if the word goes out to more people and the more support we get from outside, you know, they say the land look out for itself. Well, mm -hmm. it's, that's kind of like how it is, you know. You get what you give, basically the rules of life. So, yeah, thank you for sharing. I can appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time to do this, you know. It's important that the word gets out and more people uh, take the time to listen and make their own judgment, you know. Decide for themselves what is uh, the undeniable truth. Native peoples have always depended on the land, nature, and taking care of nature so nature can take care of you. Because it's been around a whole lot longer than man has. So the better we can understand that, uh, the better we can protect it and, and continue on as, as people. Because at the rate we're going, you know, eventually one day we're going to we end up killing ourselves all off. Then we'll go right back to just being an empty land. Mm. So cool. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mackie. I love you, Mackie. I love you too.